It's a wonderful opportunity and privilege that we have to have one more day, a first day of the week, on this side of eternity to assemble and worship our God in heaven. And were it not for God revealing himself to us and then teaching us how to worship him and teaching us the day on which to assemble to worship him, we might not all be in this same place at this same time. And so we're thankful that he's done all of that so that we can know him, trust him, and worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm thankful for each and every one that's in the assembly and thankful that I have the opportunity again to be your speaker. I turn your attention over to John chapter 16 for the introducing of our lesson this morning. In John chapter 16, Jesus is preparing to make his departure from this physical earth. He's trying to prepare the minds of those who he is closest to on earth that they have a job to do and he is sending them out to do his work. And of course, you know the anxiety they would feel because of that, that they were losing the one who had taught them so much and they wouldn't be able to put their eyes on him anymore. And so they were worried. They were worried what was going to happen to them and worried how they were going to continue this great job that they had to do. And Jesus says in chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. There seems to be a necessity of Jesus' departure from the physical earth in order for the plan to continue its fulfillment. In order for the mind of God to be uh, continually revealed to mankind, Jesus says, I've got to go away. Because if I don't, I can't send the next phase, the next helper to you so that the all truth can then be understood. And then he goes on down in verse 12 and says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, I wished I could tell you everything, but your human minds cannot grasp everything that you need to know and understand at this point. And we understand that. We understand that our minds can't wrap this itself around some of the ideas and concepts of God's word on the first hearing. He says, though, in verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Who is this comforter, this helper, this spirit of truth? What is his role in God's plan? And how does he perform that role today? If we can answer those three questions alone today, I think we'll have made great progress in understanding who this spirit of truth is. And hopefully it will give you some more uh, understanding of how God's word operates in your life. We have a congregation back home that has about 16 or 17 young people in it. When I say young people, I mean under the age of 21. That's the age group that I work the most with in my secular job. And I began to think about this topic to teach to them probably a couple of years ago. And it used to be my job to stand before classrooms of teenagers and explain concept ideas and concept uh, uh, ideas of topics such as chemistry, things you can't see. Things you can't really wrap your mind around. I would explain forces and I would explain all sorts of things going on on a molecular level. And I would get these blank stares from the kids out in the audience. I would get these kids in my class just looking at me and say, I don't understand. And so I might take a marker and go to my board and draw some things. And then I would get some models and I would make a representation of what I was talking about. Only to make the abstract more graspable. That is, they were able to understand it better. I hope that I'm able to do that today. Before I start, I need to make a few disclaimers. The Bible says that no, God has seen, uh, no man has seen God at any time. So I don't know what God looks like. But if I'm going to try to understand and wrap my feeble mind around it, I need something to sort of hold on to in my mind. And so I've made a visual, visual representation over on this side of the board. This is not what God looks like, I'm certain but it'll help us to hold on to an idea and keep it separated. Over on this side, I've drawn a picture of the outline of a man's head. They look very similar. God said, let us make man in our own image. And so I don't think I've stepped too far outside by just making them look similar. I also have a couple of props I'll introduce in just a few minutes to help you understand this. Again, in no way am I trying to give you something to see God in your mind, only to wrap your mind around this idea and this topic so that we can understand it better. Our lesson actually begins in the beginning, all the way back at the beginning of time. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created. Now, I understand a whole lot from that very statement right there. I understand a whole lot there. First of all, there was nothing until God decided to create it. 
And the only thing that existed that we have knowledge of before the worlds, the universe, the stars, and all the celestial bodies, and all the living things that are upon this earth that were in existence, God was there. And so I understand that in the beginning, whatever that may be, the beginning of time for us, the beginning of the universe, the beginning, God was there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and he created all things that exist. But in verse 2, I find something very interesting that says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters or the face of the deep. And then in verse 3, we find another interesting statement. Very early in the Bible, then God said. Then God said. For whatever means and whatever purposes he had, he decided he would communicate with his new creation through the medium of language, through the medium of speech, through the medium of words that would reveal to us his unfathomable mind. I get a little better gr uh, grasp of this in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so now I see another personality, if you'll call it that, introduced into this concept. I've got God, I've got the Spirit of God, and I have the Word. And all three, the Bible tells us, are in heaven. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, it says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now I want to note that one of those personalities is called the Word. Logos. And that word just simply means that whatever his job is, it is to convert, convey to us the medium that God had chosen to uh, bring to man his mind through language and speech. Thayer says that the word, word, means the personal wisdom and power that was in union with God. Strong says it was pre-existent in the nature of Christ. And Vine says it is the personal manifestation of the whole deity as we see him in the Son of God. And so today we recognize the Word as being Jesus Christ. But that name was not applied to him until the New Testament. That uh, name was not given to him in, in the Bible until we come to the New Testament when the Word came and dwelt among men on the earth. And he came and left heaven to be here with us. I think it's also interesting that people who have written on this subject say that all three participants in creation took their turn on the earth. God walked among men and spoke to men in the early days. He was walking in the cool of the garden with Adam. God on earth. Imagine that. And then later he would send his son, the word, to be on earth among men. And he would say, I've got to go back because if I don't, I can't send the comforter. And then the comforter would take his time on earth. I think that's an interesting statement. would probably in, uh, deserve some more investigation. But the Bible clearly states that Jesus had a mission when he came to this earth. And that mission was to cause men to believe in the one who had sent him. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. God said, all right, the time is right. The fullness of time has come. The preparations of laying the groundwork for being able to understand my plan has now reached maturity now I'm sending you forth to do the job that I have for you. Jesus would clearly declare that job in John chapter 12. He cried out and said in verse 44, Who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words, that he has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. Jesus' mission was twofold then when he came to this earth. First was to remind men, there is a God in heaven who you owe your allegiance and obedience to, and he has a message for you to understand. I am the light in this dark world, as we spoke of earlier in the meeting. I am the one that you should turn to to hear what the Father has to say. 
And then he would take that perfect life sent from heaven and give it as a sacrifice for sin. You know, many people today struggle even with the idea that there is a God. Many people today struggle with the idea that God could even exist. And so we spend a lot of time trying to make that manifest to them, trying to show them that God does and, and, and exists and that he does continue to love and take care of his people. But many people just simply don't see God. And how could they without the revelation, without God revealing himself, without God communicating with his creation? In Isaiah chapter 55, God, through the voice of a prophet, says this, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. I don't think like you do, and you don't think like I do. God said that. And so on this side of the board over here, I'm going to draw what we would call a brain cavity and just simply call this the mind of God. And what's in God's mind is not what we have in mind. But over here, we've got helpless creation made in the abyss of darkness, made on the earth with absolutely no communication except that God decided to speak to that creation. He decided to give us his words. He decided to say in Genesis chapter 3, to his creation, let there be light. We understand then that man over here is helpless without God deciding to reveal himself to us. And he has done so through the medium of speech. And he has delivered that speech in various means throughout time. In the early days of Genesis, we find there was a primitive revelation, as they call it. That is, God literally spoke to man audibly from heaven. He literally spoke to men on earth and walked with them in the cool of the garden, as we find in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. And again in Genesis chapter 20, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and he said to him, behold, thou art but a dead man. God speaking from heaven or on earth to man in a primitive revelation of himself. But that's not the only way he could get his words to us. He could also send a spokesman. He did so by angels and prophets and even by his own son, Jesus Christ. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and to Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. God says, I have spoken to you. Now you go speak to them. You are my spokesman. You are my go-between. I want you to go handle this business for me. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. God used Jesus to bring us his word so that we would understand him. Again, John chapter 12, I have not spoken of myself, Jesus said, but the Father which sent me, he gave me the commandment of what I should say and what I should speak. But that's not the only way he could reveal his words and his mind to us. He might be able to just miraculously implant that into men's minds. And he has done that before. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, When they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given to you that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father that speaks in you. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, we find this being brought into fruition and fulfillment. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What we find then is that God would miraculously put his thoughts into the minds of certain men, make that point, certain men, so that they would understand what he wanted them to know about him and his plan. Then he would have a text produced. He did this in the Old Testament. Remember Moses walking down off of Mount Sinai with written tablets? He would write things down so that men would understand them. He would do so, though, through spokesmen and medium that would allow us to know his thoughts. In John chapter 5 and verse 38, uh, Jesus points to the scriptures. He says, you think you know me, search the scriptures. They are they which testify of me. You think you have eternal life, and yet you will not come to me because... Uh, that you may have life. 
That's in John chapter 5 and verse 39. 2 Timothy chapter two, uh, 3 verse 16 says all scripture, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That word inspiration means literally breathed out of God's mouth, literally breathed the breath of God. And again, we find in 2 Peter chapter 1 that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. Therefore, I understand scriptures, scriptures, written text, are a way that God communicates with us. And so I've got at least four ways now that I understand God is teaching us his mind and revealing to us who he is and what he expects of us. And as we said, as Jesus prepared to leave with his physical absence, he promised to send one who would teach, remind, and guide those apostles into all truth. You know, for a man to be able to please God, he's got to know what God wants. For a man to be pleasing to God, he's got to know what God expects. And God, so thankfully for us, has chosen to do that through the medium of revealing himself in various means throughout time. He has done that through the medium of words, the conveyance of, of language that we might understand his thoughts. And many people today simply don't understand that concept and that process. And for that reason, they've ascribed a whole lot of things to the Holy Spirit that are not necessarily backed up with scriptural teaching. As a matter of fact, Z.T. Sweeney said this, if we view the Holy Spirit in light of the psychological manifestations in our own hearts or in the lives of those around us, which are ascribed to the Spirit, we will find ourselves wandering in a maze of mystery. And if we follow the Word of God, which is the only source of knowledge, we will find ourselves walking in a light that will grow brighter as we proceed. So thus, to understand the Holy Spirit, we've got to have a concept of His work. The Godhead, a word used in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, consists of three entities that make it up. The Godhead consists of entities that make it up. And I want to use one of my props here to help you understand that. It's difficult for us to see how three can be one and one can be in three parts or in three different uh, uh, modes. And so I have chosen to use a picture. And when I say this picture... You understand that I refer to this picture and everything that's in it. This picture is going to represent God. But if I open up this picture and get a closer look at it, I have placed some candy in here. Part of the picture? Absolutely. Is it the picture plastic itself? No, it's not. But I'm going to use that to represent something. I'm going to let this whole picture, everything in it contained, be God for our demonstration today. I have gone to the store and bought a little figurine of a man to represent the man who walked on the earth in Godhead in bodily form, the Bible says. And the candy is going to represent the Holy Spirit. And I'll show you how that works in just a minute. I've got a paper plate up here and it represents the earth. That's what it can represent. I had to write that on there. And I'm gonna let those sit for just a second. I'll come back to those. The Father, Jehovah God, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Word, we find that He dwells in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth is God. And so we need to make an understanding that whenever we speak of God, we can be speaking of any one of these components or any one of these three parts, but we may be speaking about all of them together. We may be speaking of them in their entirety. I find that the work of the Holy Spirit has been emphasized more in the last couple of centuries than it may have been in the past. And as I studied this lesson, I understood that there were men, whenever the Bible was finally released back into uh, man's hands, as it were, that they had uh, a prolific copies of it, that there was a great push to edify and teach men that there is a God in heaven and that you have responsibility to Him. And that would go on for a hundred years or more. That would be the focus. God is there. You owe Him the uh, uh, understanding of him. You owe him to learn about him. And then people would say, well, Jesus Christ, his son, seems to be the focus of the New Testament. And so for a hundred years, more or less, it would turn the teaching to Jesus Christ and the atoning work and sacrifice of Christ. And it's only been in the last couple of hundred years that people have seemed to, uh, in mainstream, preach the Holy Spirit and try to understand him. And because they tried to have a personal understanding of God and a personal understanding of the Holy uh, of Jesus Christ, they have in turn tried to have a personal understanding of the Holy Spirit in the absence of the Scriptures. And if we look in the Bible, we find that, that can't happen. 
88 times the Holy Spirit is referenced in the Old Testament. And if you hold your Bible up and put your finger in the little break between the Old and the New Covenants, the Old and the New Testament, you'll find a very thick portion of that Bible is the Old Testament. There's 88 times, give or take maybe one or two, that the Holy Spirit is referenced in that part. And then if you take that little skinny part, the New Testament, the covenant under which we live, he's referenced in that 264 times. 264 times. That gives you an indication that the work that he is performing seems to have more importance in a spiritual kingdom than in a physical kingdom. There again, yet another le uh, lesson that we could spend time looking at. What we do understand from words that are spoken of him is that he has traits of a person. He speaks. He testifies, he teaches, he guides, he leads and forbids. Those are all things that can only be accomplished by a person. He makes intercession for us. How do those words from God's mind get into our mind? Well, we understand that it is through the Holy Spirit's revelation of God's mind that we have access to know what God wants us to know. At the very most fundamental level, the most fundamental level, the work of the Holy Spirit was and is to reveal God's mind, his will, his thoughts, his plans, his purposes for man to man. Who without the revelation of that would have no idea what to do in this world. They would have no idea how to know and worship God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we find in verse 12, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given us of God, which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He confirmed the apostles when they went out to preach the gospel in Mark chapter 16 and verse 19. They went out, preached the word everywhere, the Lord with them, working with them, confirming the word with signs following. He guides, as we've already read in John chapter 16 and verse 13. In verse, uh, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 13, he leads. For if ye live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Remember last night we spoke of personal responsibility. That's our part. We have to mortify the deeds of the body. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 1 John chapter 5 tells us that he bears witness. How are these functions of the Spirit accomplished today then? Well, I find in Hebrews chapter 1 a little more to add to this. God who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. What I know is at the beginning, God used the fathers of families to speak to them. He would tell them his expectations and what he wanted them to do. And later he would choose the medium of spokesmen, prophets, that he would reveal his intentions and words to and tell them, you tell the people that. And then later he would send to us his son, Jesus Christ, to walk among men. He would say, you speak the words that I have given you. Jesus said, that which I have heard is what I'm telling you. I'm speaking the words God told me to speak to you. God revealing his mind. The fathers first, then by prophets to man, and then through his son, Jesus Christ. But that's not all. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 27, we find Jesus speaking to the apostles. And he says, what I tell you in darkness, that speak you in the light. What I'm telling you privately, you teach publicly. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Jesus would again say in Matthew chapter 28, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Paul would tell Timothy, verse, chapter 4, verse 6. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. If you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So what I understand is that Jesus would call these men to him, and he would deliver to those apostles the words that God had delivered to him. He would speak to those apostles and give them the words of God. The New Testament shows us how those apostles work in the book of Acts. And we find that they went many places and they would preach the word of God to men. And in some cases, some cases, they would find men who were faithful enough that they would trust them to give them a gift of the Holy Spirit, such as to speak in tongues. 
What does that mean? To speak in tongues. Many people today get this confused. If you go to Acts chapter 2 and you find that whenever Peter stood up and spoke, and then the other apostles began to speak, the people in that audience were astonished because we hear them in our own language or tongue. It was marvelous to them that they all men were came, had come from the same general area, spoke the same general language on an everyday basis. But whenever they stood up and they knew they were unlearned, they hadn't been trained, they stood up and began to speak to them. They realized these guys can speak our language. And that's a marvelous thing because they've never been trained. And we understand the Spirit was poured out on those apostles that day to be able to do that, to be able to preach the words of God in a tongue that the people that were gathered in that great assembly there on the day of Pentecost could understand. It wasn't something that was unintelligible. It wasn't something that you couldn't explain. It was something that they very aptly explained. And those apostles would then travel the world and they would lay their hands on other people and give them the gift of prophecy. So I'm going to call these guys New Testament prophets. Now what I understand is there's sort of a loss in the amount of the ability that's passed from each level to the other. We know Jesus had the spirit without measure, as the Bible tells us. The apostles had a great deal of the spirit, but they didn't have what Jesus had. And then as they passed the gifts of the spirit on, we read about in 1 Corinthians, we understand what they gave. They might just give one gift here and there. There was a great dispute in Corinth, as a matter of fact, over whose gift was better and who stood to have more uh, uh, notoriety, popularity, fame because of the gift that they had. And Paul just simply said, I wished everybody could speak in tongues. I'd rather you be able to prophesy because that's how you edify. You teach. You teach what? You teach in the mind of God. I'd rather you be able to speak in tongues so you could reach more people, but I'd rather you be able to teach so that other folks could understand those things. And as I understand that, the apostles would eventually die, as all men do, and leave behind the words that they had spoken with the men they had taught. But before they died, before they died, they penned letters down to different congregations they were familiar with, to different men they were familiar with. And they would write down those things that they wanted to remind them, knowing, the Holy Spirit and God knowing, that those things would be preserved for people in 2022 even, to be able to find out what God expects of us. They would pin those things down into a written text that we could pick up and read and study anytime we chose to, to know the mind of God. Whenever they stood up and began to speak those words, the people there accused them of doing things that were sinful. These men are drunk. They're full of new wine. What they're doing, they simply are trying to gain attention by that. So I'm going to let my apostles be the only apostles I could find at Walmart. That's Peter. As we've already pointed out, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to walk on earth and teach these apostles what he expected. He spoke to them face to face and gave them his words. But he said, you can't bear everything I've got to say right now. I got a lot more to tell you. Unless I go away, the comforter won't come. But if I go away, he'll come and he will bring you into remembrance of all things that I have taught you. He gave his life as a sacrifice for sin, part of his mission on earth. He rose from the grave on the third day, just as was prophesied by the Holy Spirit, and returned back to the Father in heaven. He told those apostles, you go to Jerusalem and you wait. Wait for what? You wait until you be endued with power from on high. You wait until the Holy Spirit comes, in other words. And that's when you know that this time will start in which you will learn to be taught and guided in all things. In Joel chapter 2 verse 29, the Bible said in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That will suffice. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
and men would know his will by that pouring out. These apostles would go into the world and take the mind of God to men and teach them what they needed to know. But as all men do, eventually they would die. They would be removed from the earth, leaving only the words that they had had delivered to them miraculously. Now what? Now what? It's just floating around? It's just out there? No. They wrote letters and contained those words. And over time, men would gather those letters, taking the bits and pieces that had been, re been revealed in various measures and parts, and collect them into a volume which we could have and know what God's mind is. And now we can go to just about any bookstore in America, almost the world, and you can go buy the revealed mind of God in several different languages that you can have and know what God would have for you to do. But that's doing me no good. It's in there, but it's doing me no good. For me to understand and know what I must do, I gotta take it out. And I've gotta partake of it. And that's how you find out what the Holy Spirit's work in life is, or His work for you is in your life. That's how you understand what He wants for you to know and do. Some people today don't understand that. They want to have another miraculous revelation as though they're an apostle. They want to have someone teach them something that they don't have to sit down and study and learn for themselves. They want to learn without effort. And the Bible says that if you're going to find God, He is going to reward those who diligently seek him you got to open the book to get the candy out amen you got to open the book to understand what god's mind has revealed to those who wanted us to understand it the apostles who wrote those things down that they knew that needed to be spoken and said to places and people who had problems very similar to ours and we've got to open the book to know it it does you no good as long as the candy stays in the book You've got to take it out and put it in your mind and you've got to digest it so that the mind of god can be revealed to you The revelation that has been made known is found through the written word of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says he gave some apostles. He gave some prophets. He gave some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. The completion of God's plan to reveal his mind will continue to be carried by spokesmen. He no longer speaks like he did in the Garden of Eden. He no longer speaks like he did through Moses or even through his son Jesus. He's delivered those things to be recorded in a volume that we can understand. The apostles have died, taking with them the ability to impart spiritual gifts. Remember whenever Simon the sorcerer saw that by the laying on of the apostles' hands these gifts were given, he wanted to be part of it. These men died. And the men who they put their hands on have died. What does that leave us? You know any evangelists? Sure you do. You know any pastors, elders? Sure you do. You know any teachers? Absolutely. You know what their job is? To speak the mind of God into the mind of man so we can understand what God would have us to do for the perfecting of the saints, the completing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body of Christ. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing, Jesus said. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Hold fast the form of sound words which you have heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. In Ephesians chapter 3, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory 
to be strengthened with might in his spirit in the inner man. How do you get strength? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's characteristics, His mind, His plan of redemption, His will, His purposes of glory, His promises are all revealed in some manner by the Holy Spirit. But for our age, it has been written and inspired in the inspired written Word of God. Today we understand what the Bible says in Jude verse 3. Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. That's what Jude intended to write. But I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend for the, uh, earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It's been delivered once for all. There are no additions to be made to it. There are no changes to be made to it. While the Holy Spirit is not an overwhelming influence, he is also not an irresistible urge. He is also not something that we can tangibly feel or see on every front, as many people would have for you to know. Some people use the phrase, better felt than told. I would ask you if it's the Holy Spirit's work to convert someone, why were the apostles sent out on perilous journeys to teach it? Why not let the Holy Spirit do that? Why not let him do all the work? No, they were commanded to go and preach, teach the word, and baptize those who believed in Jesus Christ. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have made, been, uh, been made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come to renew them to repentance. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. We understand Colossians 3 and 10 says, Put on the new man. Renewed in knowledge. Knowledge of what? The mind of God. Revealed to us in his word. 1 Corinthians 2 again verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. But the spirit who is from God. That we might know the things. That are freely given to us. These things not we also speak. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches. But which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may be instruct him? Paul says, though, but we, speaking of the apostles, have the mind of Christ. In conclusion today, God created man and chose to reveal himself to us. He did so through the medium of language. At times in the past, he spoke directly. And then through mediums, or spokesmen, the prophets, and then his son, Jesus. Jesus would speak to the apostles. Forty days after his resurrection, he told them some things that we don't have a record of, other than what we see in the New Testament epistles. They would make those that they laid their hands on have some of that knowledge. But I find over in Acts, when Paul was in Ephesus, chapter 19, Paul laid his hands on them and gave them the gift of the prophecy. They could teach. But you know what else Paul did? He stayed for three more months at least. Why? Because he was preaching. He didn't give them everything. He gave them enough to go out and convert others. And he stayed and preached after imparting the gift of prophecy. What does that tell me? If they had everything delivered by the laying on the hands, Paul had no need to stay there. He could have gone on and continued to pass that gift. But he went and stayed with them and, and preached for three more months after he laid his hands on them and gave them the gift of prophecy. They've all died now. And we have written records of God's words and his thoughts and his mind that our evangelists and our pastors, our elders, and our teachers stand in positions very similar to this one and sit across the kitchen table with you and sit in your homes or at the library or in the workplace and tell you what God wants you to do so that you can come to a knowledge of him. The Holy Spirit quickens and gives life. The Holy Spirit dwells in us and strengthens us when we obey the gospel and allow it to transform our lives. Because we have the free will to obey God, we also have the free will to disobey God. Paul told Timothy, don't neglect the gift that was given to thee. Use it, which lets me know it's something you could neglect. You can neglect your study of God's word. 
Timothy could neglect using his gift to teach others. What I do want to say is this. The Holy Spirit is not seen in the scriptures making decisions for people. In Acts chapter 2, the apostles stood up and they preached an understandable doctrine. But the men that were baptized, 3,000 of them that day, had to make their own decision. They had to make their own decision based upon what they had heard and whether they believed it enough to obey it. He doesn't make the decision for you. Some people believe that that's the case, but it's not. You've got to understand it and obey it. He also doesn't cause chaotic outbursts, as some people say. Some people will tell you the behavior that they carry on in some worship services is caused by the Holy Spirit. And then they do things that we don't find recorded in God's Word. I don't make fun of this. I'm not po poking fun, only to point out that if the Holy Spirit is doing something, then if He's revealed all truth, if He has once for all delivered the faith, then what else is there to add to that? Who can have anything beyond what's written in the Word of God and consider it to be part of God's truth. The Holy Spirit was never given for the benefit solely, solely of the person in whom he worked. Miraculously. He didn't just inhabit somebody's body, dwell in somebody's body so they could say, y'all see, I'm a Christian. That wasn't why he was there. He was there to teach other people how to become Christians. He was never seen improving the financial, social, or personal status of men. Now, I don't dare put handcuffs on what God can do. Don't take that, what I'm saying, is me telling you what God will and won't do through the Holy Spirit. I can't put handcuffs on him and tell him what, he, what, what I think that he can't do. Some today, though, will specify certain actions as being led by the Spirit. If that's true, if that's true, there will be something written to back up what they're telling you they're doing. If what they're doing is led by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, you'll find something in here parallel to it. Because he's given us all truth through his apostles. Nothing that the Holy Spirit does in the lives of Christians will ever contradict the revealed word of God. And a person who claims to be led by the Spirit will be of all things a student of the scriptures. Because that is a product of the Holy Spirit. I leave the lesson with you this morning. I hope that I have helped you, maybe strengthened you and given you some understanding that perhaps you had thought of. And maybe didn't have a way to wrap your mind around. I know that I gained a lot from studying this topic. Moreover, I was able to explain it to my kids and the kids back home in a way that they understood it. That's why I chose to use visual aids. I wonder if I'm speaking to someone here today who's not a Christian. The Bible teaches us that God, knowing that man was lost, sent his son into this world to reveal God to us, teach us about him, be the light in darkness, and then give his life as a sacrifice for sin. In so doing, he gave us his commandments of how we should live and how to act and how to come to him and receive that gift of salvation. He said, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. He says to those in Luke chapter 13, Jesus said, except you repent, you will also perish. So we understand we've got to change our lives and live a life of re reformation. Repentance, as we spoke of last night, means changing your mind on how you're going to live and putting that into action. Jesus said you can't do this silently. Matthew 10, 32. If you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before the Father. On the day when we stand before God give an account of ourselves at the judgment bar, I want Jesus to confess me. He's one of ours. But he says if you won't do that publicly, I'll not do that for you. And the Bible says that shortly before our Savior went back and before he sent the Comforter, that he said, you go into the world and you preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. As I pointed out several nights this week, we love thou shalt and thou shalt not because they're cut and dried. There's no more cut and dried scripture in the Bible than he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you've not taken those steps to become a Christian, why not? Why not? The Holy Spirit has been revealed. There's nothing new coming. God's word is true. Simply obey it. If you're here this morning, you stand in need to make a confession of fault in a public capacity. We, of course, will assist you with that also while we stand in sight. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, 
it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So go ahead, do it. Like right now, click on it.